<coughs> okay, so welcome back. Uh, taking a look at our progress, we've actually made quite a noticeable amount of progress. Um, last we left off, we were actually clearing out some of this side, so we had more than just this narrow hallway here available to us. Um, and I believe our shovel had broken at the time or something. I don't remember. It's been a day. I was just basically rewatching the entire of my entire Minecraft Let's Play series. Um, I've done a lot. Uh, yeah, so I'm basically uh, recording late at night. Uh, I passed out a few times, so I guess I rested? Question mark? <laughs> um, I showed my, my Let's Play series to my dad. He said he likes it. Uh, so that's good. <laughs> um, a lot of it is mostly just me talking about random stuff. Um, whatever comes to mind, mostly. And... I don't know. It's just a good way to vent whatever's on my mind and just consider my options and see what I'm capable of doing while I think out loud, mostly. Verbalizing the thought process can prove beneficial for quite a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> I forget who, but I know there was some really smart person who liked to vocalize their thoughts and, and their concepts and their ideas, and I do not remember which person it was. <laughs> Um, I remember they were really smart, like, they're well respected in the scientific communities to this day and all this, I just don't remember who they were. Um, but yeah, there's, there's smart people who just, for all intents and purposes, for what people could see, they were just talking to themselves, and it's like, why are you talking to yourself? Well, I'm vocalizing my thought. You know, I have a concept and I have to present this idea to other people and so I am saying what I'm going to tell them so that when I say it, it is able to accurately describe what I'm trying to convey. You know, Um, because if you can't explain what you're trying to, uh, describe, then you're going to have difficulty communicating. So you have to be able to not just know the words, but you have to be willing to utilize your words. And capable, of course. Hmm. 
Man, I go through a lot of tools when I'm mining all of this out. This is kind of the boring part, is just digging through the entirety of a mountain. Um, my friend Kyle had an online Minecraft server that I could play on, but oh, I got clipped through the world a little bit there, so I saw all of the caves beneath my base, which quite fortunately appears to be none. Which is great news, because that means I don't have to worry about spawners. Bedrock, probably. So, yeah, I'm just mining through all of this rock and just swinging the pickaxe and digging, digging, digging. I seem to be going through the shovels faster than the pickaxes which is definitely worthy of, of noting. I just want to make sure I grab everything before I go sleep in a bed and kill off all the undead that spawned. <laughs> and stuff. Um, I'll probably save the chicken and I'll probably just let the feathers despawn in the lava or, or whatever. Whatever happens to them. You know, I'll probably just let them sit there and let them despawn. Because honestly, the feathers are going to need a lot more uh, a lot more storage if I'm going to actually be using them because I'm going to have to sit there and work through all the gravel until I get enough flint and then I'm going to have to go out and chop some trees and by that point, I'll need even more flint, and then I'll need more... Well, I probably won't need more trees, because the trees are breaking them down all the way into twigs, which is just a lot of material. So, that's probably going to be perfectly fine. Um...
here. Oh, look, there's a spider over there, lovely. I'll have to take it on before nighttime shows up because once nighttime happens, they'll become aggressive. In the meantime, they're nice and peaceful and they don't want to murder me, which is always nice. So yeah, I've, I've just, I've got a lot on my mind. Um, like, I miss playing Dungeons and Dragons, but I miss playing it the way that I used to play it, where, like, people would actually be in the same room as each other, and people would actually describe what they're doing and try and act out the scenes and like people would pay attention to the the host the game master and uh, when they did that they of course would uh, just enjoy the the scene unfolding before them. They wouldn't need validation for... I'm just so used to running all the way into the <laughs> bedroom every time. Uh, they wouldn't really need to wait for the validation of, you know, can I do this? Or, uh, you know, what is it I'm capable of doing? Because they were skilled enough players to already know, you know, what each skill that they possess is capable of achieving. Um, which sounds impressive until you realize it just means that they repeatedly studied what they were uh, capable of doing until they memorized their skill sheet. Um, which doesn't sound as impressive. But it is actually still decently impressive. Mostly it's impressive because uh, the edition we were playing was the 3.5 edition, which if you're not familiar with the 3.5 edition of Dungeons & Dragons, it can be described as extremely rules intensive. Um, there are a lot of rules and you gotta remember a lot of them in order to even just play your character because you have to remember all of the rules for combat you need to remember all of the rules for uh, if you end up injured you have to remember all of the different ways you can get healed you have to remember 
just a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's a lot. It really is. Um, am I running low on sticks? I am running low on sticks. I'm running low on planks as well. I'll need to convert more, uh, more logs soon. Um, so yeah, um, but I had a really good, uh, person who used to, uh, host the Dungeons and Dragons game, um, and they were the person who originally introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, and I cannot, for the life of them, find them. I know their name was Steve, and I know they were old, and <laughs> that's about all I remember. Um, I know if I saw them again, I'd probably recognize them. Unless they, like, gained a few hundred pounds or something. Um, but, like, I don't really get to play with people who really describe what they want to do. And that's the part that I missed most about Dungeons and Dragons is the interaction of the players with the game master. Like, Everyone has their own thing, yeah, but there's something special about just the interaction itself. Like, the activity itself seems to just be nice. It's a simple little game where you just sit there with some dice and you roll the dice around and you see if you manage to successfully figure out if, uh, you know, you get to do what idea you wanted to do. Uh, you get to find out if your idea succeeded or not. And you can sometimes have good ideas, and you can sometimes have bad ideas, and sometimes your bad ideas work out nicely, and sometimes the good ideas work out badly. Um, and sometimes there's just this middle ground, and you just gotta work through it. Um... And Dungeons and Dragons is a great example of how to apply a concept of uh, of order to a chaotic world. And like the backstory of Dungeons and Dragons is very chaotic and convoluted, and it's got all of these divergences and confusing twists and turns in the plot line. You know, there are gods that were born, gods that went missing, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and then, of course, you have the game of Dungeons and Dragons going on amongst all of this. So, of course, the game is going to be very weird as a result, but the game is weird mostly because of the people that play it, not so much because of the events going on. Because if you notice, the events going on are just weird. Just plain weird. You know? But the people that play it seem to make normal characters and then they manage to turn everything into some sort of smoldering train wreck 
and in the process they make their characters seem like some sort of hero or villain, or perhaps somewhere in between, perhaps both. Perhaps they play some weird, psychopathic, dichotomized uh, person who suffers from paranoid delusions. There's really no single way to play Dungeons and Dragons that can be effectively qualified as a one-way-fits-all type of ordeal. Because if you try to fit all players of Dungeons and Dragons into that category, you're going to find out that you're just wrong. Um, and you really need to have a broad spectrum viewpoint in order to understand that. If you don't have that broad ve uh, spectrum viewpoint, you're going to quickly realize that not everyone wants to play that game because a lot of people will think that your game is silly, stupid, boring, or otherwise uninteresting, and they'll be very unamused as a result. Um, which, of course, is not fun. It's not a good thing. Mm. So we try and avoid such situations to ensure that uh, we maintain value in the game so that people can enjoy playing it and they'll feel like they got their money's worth and then they'll want to invest more money in the company that made the game because they'll start realizing, hey, these people make good games. I like that company. I want to buy more from that company. You know? And that's how companies like Final Fantasy's uh, Square Enix, um, which used to just be Square or Enix, they used to be separate companies, but um, then they merged, they bought each other out. I'm sure there were quite a few people who were fired or something. Um, but the point is that the two companies merged specifically because neither of them wanted to stop making games. They wanted to keep making games. They just couldn't afford to keep making games separately. Um, now, that being said, they probably could have continued to work separately. Um, although... It does seem that uh, the resulting merger has worked out nicely for them. So that's good for them. You know? Uh, the various companies associated with uh, Square Enix that I've noticed. Um, for example, when they did a cooperative uh, game with Blizzard Entertainment, I noticed that their game performed very well. Uh, and Blizzard Entertainment, of course, is famous for one of the competing franchises. Ow. Um, one of the competing franchises, the World of Warcraft series. Um, if you're not familiar with World of Warcraft, uh, good for you. <laughs> because it is very convoluted and full of names that I probably can't pronounce accurately. And I don't really understand... Uh, why it seems so competitive when it's supposed to be uh, PvE, which is basically player versus environment. Um, the 
Final Fantasy XI franchise that I was playing at the time that I was learning most about uh, <laughs> about World of Warcraft. I was learning it while playing their competitor, Final Fantasy XI. <laughs> um, and the people that were playing Final Fantasy XI who used to play World of Warcraft were telling me that the thing they liked most about Final Fantasy XI was how much simpler it was. You didn't need to make uh, like any massive changes to your character just in order to uh, change your your nation affiliation because you wanted a different nation's bonus uh, applied to your character. Instead, you simply just uh, through the proper procedures you uh, go to one of the nations and you change your affiliation and you're capable of doing that I think once a week um, which isn't half bad uh, it allows you quite a lot of flexibility because you're then capable of capitalizing on that nation's transport to, uh, system. And, of course, each nation will have uh, different supplies available based on their uh, win streak. And there were people who, of course, went out of their way to make a character and have each character be bound to a separate nation so that they could access all of the deals and capitalize on the player uh, markets so that you know they could provide resources to the, the players. Um, and that was actually a very good industry in that game. Um, that was really, really driving a lot of the sales and a lot of the commerce of the Final Fantasy XI franchise was being done through the manipulation of the auction house prices on the goods which were commonly available. And... I will say this, inflation was rampant because of the real money trading going on. Um, and they were really buckling down on it. It's just people were just pouring money into the game and they weren't slowing down. Um, but like the gamer, the game developers wanted people to work for their money. And the people were like, no, I want to pay to win. And it's like, no, this is a real money transaction for in-game content that you did not work for. We cannot verify that you worked for it. We can verify that you paid for it. Um, <laughs> and that's in the rules that says this is one of the things we don't allow. So... You broke the rules, so your account is, of course, banned. And it's like, okay, well, um, what about the other, like, 17 bajillion people who were affected because this person went and, for example, bought up all of the uh, giant stingers, and then he started selling them for, like, four times the price. <laughs> Because he had all of this money and he was like, I'm going to spend all of this money making other people's lives uh, slightly more miserable and I'm just going to jack up all the prices and uh, be mean to all of those other people who want all of this stuff uh, because they want to work on their alchemy, for example. <laughs> Something I was uh, working on when I was playing was my alchemy. I was trying to work alchemy up to level 100, but I wasn't taking the normal route, 
which usually involves uh, spending thousands upon thousands of gold at the uh, auction house in order to purchase all of my alchemy ingredients so that I can just craft it all up and then work my way up to the highest level. Instead, I wanted to use something that would actually be useful to people and so I started crafting the giant stingers into antidotes and people were actually taking notice that uh, I was the guy making antidotes and it's like, oh, you noticed that? It's like, yeah, because you're the only guy <laughs> making antidotes. It's like, oh, is it really that rare that when someone actually is making antidotes that um, people actually notice? It's like, yeah, it's really that rare. Why is it so rare? And I was like, oh, well, it's probably because of the ingredients. They were like, oh, what's the ingredients? Oh, well, it's mercury. So, you know, that's an easy ingredient. They were like, oh, man, that's all the way out there in Sandery. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, um, that's my home nation. So I can just teleport, uh, teleport home and I'll be right next to the shop. So any outpost is just quick access, you know, need mercury? Oh yeah, yeah, just go right there, it's fine. Um, and they were like, oh, but what about, uh, what about when, when this nation's in the lead? Uh, like, uh, I think it was Bastok was the, one of the competing nations. Um, and, uh, I was like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that outpost is way out in the middle of nowhere. And even without the outpost, like, it is a very nice long hike to the town. But, like, uh, A, I had a chocobo whistle, which means I had raised a chocobo taking an entire month in real life. <laughs> For whatever reason, I thought that was a good idea. Um, and I spent an entire month basically taking care of this little yellow bird. Um, and the bird ended up being uh, slightly above average. So it ended up being faster than the uh, ones that I could uh, rent. And so I would also, uh, I would always be able to tell when someone purchased a chocobo and when someone used their own whistle to summon a chocobo because my chocobo was faster, barely, than the chocobos that you could purchase. Um, but if you raised your own, you probably spent a lot of time and money on it and you probably spent like thousands upon thousands of gold um, not even exaggerating uh, the food alone for a week was like a thousand <laughs> and you have to feed this thing for 30 days so it's definitely expensive to raise a chocobo uh, however the benefit of being able to summon it in the field and not needing to pay the money to the very few Chocobo uh, taxi locations available is quite the nice benefit in Final Fantasy XI. Um, there were a few locations where you couldn't summon Chocobo. Um, for example, you couldn't summon Chocobo in your safe house because that would be silly. You know, A, where are you going to write it in your safe house? Um, yes, you, of course, want to sometimes pose with your Chocobo in your safe house. I understand that. Um, however, if you really want to put that much effort into posing with your Chocobo, um, there are... Uh, ways to modify the graphics files so you can just turn one of your furniture items into your chocobo and you'll be able to pose with your chocobo minus one random furniture item that you 
decide on. Um, works much better that way. Um, okay, I'll probably need to sleep before I leave. Um, but yeah, like you can do all kinds of different things in Final Fantasy XI. 14 I have not played. Um, however, the way they described 14, I already knew that I was probably not going to enjoy Final Fantasy 14 because they did take away some of the primary components that just made the game great. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, what do you mean? Like, what kind of, what kind of components did they take away? What, what was some of the stuff that you liked? And I was like, well, it's difficult to describe it, but simply put, it's just not the same, you know? And they thought about it for a while, and they realized... You know, you're right. I was playing it the other day, and I was just looking at it, and it's like, man, I remember playing Final Fantasy XI, and I remember what that was like, and that was so much more fun than this. And it's like, yeah. So, it's really a shame that they shut down the console servers on Final Fantasy XI because, uh, like, I know my friend Jimmy still plays, uh, or still had installed his Final Fantasy XI data uh, on his PlayStation 2 hard drive. Um, you know, he was... He, he enjoyed playing it, and I enjoyed playing it as well. He was the one who originally got me interested, uh, among a few other people. Uh, let's see. Put that there. Put that there. Okay. Now... I can make it here. I almost went all the way back to base just to make more tools and I could just make it here. But yeah, like, my friends were pretty nice for the few friends that I had. Um, they weren't always great people. Uh, sometimes I had really, really terrible friends. And other times I had wonderful friends. Um, the problem is the wonderful friends were vastly, uh, vastly outweighed by the Terrible friends. I had way, mo way more terrible friends than I had nice friends, and that was a problem. Um, that was a problem growing up. Uh, but I, of course, adapted. I learned to fight. <laughs> uh, I learned self-defense, and it has helped me. Um, I don't know if it's helped me for the better, but it has helped me, and I know how to fight. Um, I've been treated badly quite a few times in my life. Uh, a lot of people ask me to talk about my life, and it's like, well, what if I don't want to talk about my life? What if my life was terrible? You know, that's always something that People don't really think about, what if you ask them, well, how was your life? You know, tell me about yourself. And what if the answer is, well, my life started when, you know, my parents might have 
if you're a Dungeons and Dragons character, it's usually, well, my life started with my parents trying to kill me. What? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are a few Dungeons and Dragons characters that are like that, I know for sure. <laughs> um, there's probably a few humans who are like that too, sadly. Um, But yeah, like, what what if the response is that the person's life was not very good? How does one even react to that? How is one supposed to react to a situation where you're asking, you know, well, tell me about yourself, what kind of stuff are you interested in, what do you like... And their response is, well, um, like, people don't like me. <laughs> and my life's been completely bullshit and, and terrible and awful. And how do you respond to such a situation? Is it, It's something that really... A lot of people struggle with because how do you respond to such a situation it is an actually a pretty good question um, and of course the way you respond to such a situation is very important and very relevant um, because if you respond to such a situation the wrong way, you could really hurt that person's feelings. And sometimes that person might not forgive you for what was said or done or implied or thought about. You never know. You know, you really never know. So, you know. A lot of people wonder why is it you're always so well behaved like you're you're just you're a good person how do you do it and I say simple can you tell me whether or not God's a mind reader true or false is God a mind reader if God is a mind reader would God approve of what you've done would God like you for what you are? And more importantly, would you feel that you like the result of what God thinks of you? Because if God doesn't like you, well, God's usually the... Uh, the wrathful type. God doesn't like a lot of people, and God definitely has a very powerful way of showing it, because God gets violent. Um, and if you're not aware of that, then clearly you've not read the Bible. Um, God has ordered a lot of people to die and a lot of people are still alive only because humans decided to say that's not something that should be applied because that just doesn't sound right you know so for all of these people who are waiting for you know, the end of times. Okay, let's talk about the end of times. So, let's talk about how you're supposed to get stoned to death for something you did 17 years ago. Okay, let's talk about that. And they go, what do you mean? Wait, 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 wait. What are you talking about? Oh, well, you said you wanted the Bible, right? Okay, so according to the Bible, this happens, this happens, and this happens when this happens. And they're like, but 
but that was like 17 years ago. I repented. Oh, yeah. Um, here's what God says about sinners. Um, as you can see, he's got a long track record of uh, forgiveness, right? That's, that's what uh, flaming death tornadoes and, uh, you know, whipping people with thorned whips in church. I'm sure that's what flaying and, and all this other stuff, I'm sure that's what they were talking about. Um, yeah, church is violent. <laughs> uh, people probably don't tell you that. Like, they're all like, oh, good Christian values. Good Christian values involves abuse, you know? Like, it legitimately involves abuse. Um, depending on which version of the Bible you're reading, which translation, which, by the way, that's the main difference, is the translation. Um, a lot of stuff they have made nicer over the years, uh, but a lot of the stuff is just brutal. Um, and honestly, if you knew it was in your Bible, you probably wouldn't be reading the Bible. <laughs> You'd probably be going, Bible? Uh, that thing? Are you sure you're a Christian? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a good person. Why? Uh, but you're reading the Bible. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with the Bible? Oh, you're new here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it's a difficult thing to explain how religion can sometimes be a problem to some people and not everyone appreciates that and not everyone goes out of their way to understand that and of course that can be problematic um, but as long as we try to mitigate the problems so that we don't need to overly extend our focus on the topic, then we usually find ourselves uh, handling the information better. Um, and just so we're clear, a lot of the conversations involving the Bible, if you're actually genuinely interested, um, a lot of the conversations would involve basically killing off half of the population for things that they did when they were a child. And when I say a child, I'm talking like two months old, three months old. Um, the Bible is not nice. The Bible is very, very much full of hatred and wrath. And a lot of people have actually had the Bible read to them. And uh, this was actually during the whole uh, awareness campaign of, you know, how much do you actually know about Muslim heritage? And they had put a Quran sleeve on the Bible so that it was dressed up as the Quran. And they read from the Bible. And they read this to people on the streets. And they asked them, would you want this taught in your schools? Um, you know, would you, would you want this in your neighborhood as, as a religious organization? This is what they teach. And the people were going, oh my God, no, that's horrible. And then it was revealed to them afterwards, oh, well, this is the Christian Bible. Um, the Koran is actually a different book. This isn't the Koran. And they were like, wait, that's the Bible? <laughs> that's, in the, that, that's in the Christian church? Are you sure? It's like, yeah, here it is. Um, it, it's, it's the Bible. And it's like, wow. 
you know, a lot of people don't realize, yeah, the Bible is a violent and bloody book. It is very, very hateful. And the Bible has a lot of spite. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Like, the, the various uh, groups that uh, build the Bible and represent uh, each other in the Bible, they, they have their reasons for saying what they say. And I don't always agree with those reasons. However, they are entitled to their right to say those reasons. Um, mostly because everyone involved with those reasons by now has long since died. Um, which means I don't really care about what they're saying because, well, they've died, you know, if they're no longer alive, why would I want to care about what they're saying? They're dead. Um, and a lot of people don't like that kind of honesty about me because I can sometimes find myself in awkward situations where I'm trying to figure out if maybe I'm going crazy and I need some help. Other times, it's something a lot simpler. <laughs> Um, but like, every time, no matter what, the entirety of, uh, of the problem is usually solved by simply just sitting down and discussing what's going on, you know? Um, they had all of those people at the Tower of Babel, and the Tower of Babel fell, and what did people do? They talked to each other about it, you know? And then they realized that they can't understand each other. That's the story of the Tower of Babel. Um, and it's a very peaceful story, as you can tell, you know? A tower fell over, and people talked to each other, and they realized, hey, nobody understands each other. <laughs> oh, right, I'm supposed to use the bed. Um, but, like, the people were capable of figuring out things as they progressed through the, you know, through the years and the different groups supposedly uh, each diverged into their own languages and they each uh, made use of each other's talents in order to uh, make sure that they were capable of working together because well that's something important to everyone everyone wants to work together um because if you don't work together you're probably gonna die <laughs> um so eh, i didn't get the good one um yeah People like working together because if you don't work together, you usually end up dead. Um, as surprising as it may be to hear that, that is true. Um, and if you don't want to be dead, 
then the simple answer is find a way to work together. Um, sometimes things are bad and sometimes things are good. And if the things are bad, then make it so the things are not bad. Uh, and you don't want to make it so that things are not bad by changing the definition of what is and is not bad. Instead, you want to make the situation better. You know, you want to make it so that whatever is causing the situation to get worse is no longer capable of making the situation worse. Um, and you have to also ask yourself, what is the thing that is making the situation worse? Is it something I'm doing or is it something someone else is doing or something else uh, in this day and age? <laughs> um, like, is it something that is capable of changing based on anything I'm capable of controlling? Is there anything I can do to make it so that this situation is not making everyone else upset? Um... And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Um, either way, that's fine. It's fine to not know. Um, not knowing simply means there's more to learn. You know? That's all it means when you don't know. Um... That being said, if you don't ask questions, then it doesn't matter how much you know, because all of that information gets completely washed away because you have no context. You have no one to share it with. Um, like, yeah, you have all of this information, but what is the context? How are you viewing it? What are you viewing it with? You know, if you're watching, for example, you know, the Scooby-Doo show or, or Steven Universe or something, then that's great. But if you have no context and you just know there's this person named Steven, okay, that's great. Who's Steven? And why are they the best? <laughs> you know? Um, and it's like... It, it's, it's Steven Universe is the reference. But if I don't know who that is already, then the reference is going to just not make any impact. Um, so using the reference more often is just going to cause more problems because if I don't know, how can I tell you? Um, and if I'm not asked questions, how can I teach you? There's really no way that I'm capable of uh, compressing enough information to explain the finer aspects of uh, of a concept if I don't have the capacity to know the context in which the content was being displayed. And so, 
if I don't have that contextual advantage, then the data is not going to provide any form of useful feedback for me, which means it doesn't matter how much uh, of the content is being viewed by others because I have zero information on what's going on. You know, it's less of if it's not there, it doesn't affect me. And it's more of I have no idea it exists and therefore it doesn't really matter to me because it otherwise has no foundational existence in my conceptual formation of the world. I can't utilize the data if I don't know the data exists. Um, so if I'm not aware of something, then there's less impact, maybe. But if I just don't know something exists, like if I didn't know what a wheel was, and then suddenly I discovered a bicycle, you know, I would think that's amazing. And then somebody somewhere might mention a car. And I'd think, oh my god, a car? Is that like two bicycles? And it's like, no, it's much faster than a bicycle. <laughs> it's much more complex than a bicycle as well. Um, but like, you get the idea. It really drives home the point of if you don't know, how can you make use of the information? How can it be useful if you just don't know? If you have no concept of what's going on, how can you help yourself, much less others? You know? Somehow we got on this topic from talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so yeah, like, Dungeons and Dragons is a great game. Um, I know I talk about it a lot, and that's because, well, there's a lot of it to talk about. Um... Not a lot of topics are considered safe to talk about amongst all audiences, and Dungeons and Dragons is one of those ones where it's kind of in the middle ground. Partially because of bards. <laughs> um, the current uh, fame of bards, of course, being amongst uh, the voice actor Sam Regal, who uh, works on Critical Role, and of course, plenty of other various uh, people who uh, did podcasts of Dungeons & Dragons. But um, let's be honest, the amount of the fan base, the size of the fan base uh, for voice actors and stuff is quite heavily leaning towards uh, towards the critical role cast because of the uh, affluence of the cast and because they're just so darn charismatic. Um, So yeah, uh, what's the video at? Oh my, well over an hour. 
Um, so this will be a, a double episode, it looks like. <laughs> Um, uh, I could tell you to like, comment, and subscribe right now, but let's be honest, this is going in the second video. <laughs> um. So yeah, um, like... The various crew members and cast members of the Critical Role team and the Geek and Sundry team and all those various other people are are quite nice and I find their witty humor quite uh, quite delightful. Um, I like to listen to them when I am mindlessly digging out entire hillsides. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, <laughs> well, well, I like digging out entire hillsides, stares at the gigantic wall of the hill that I just dug out. Yeah. <laughs> Wonder what I've been thinking about listening to while I sit here recording all of this. Um, so yeah, um, like Dungeons.